Josh, if you want to come up and get prepped. All right, guys, let's give a hand to Josh Justin. Thanks for coming out. Hi. How are you? All right, this is really loud. Let's see. Let's away from the walk a little bit. Well, he's like adjusting, aren't you? Okay. All right. So, um, hi. So my talk today is about how my son became a hacker, uh, which was terrifying to find out as a dad. Um, and I will, uh, I'm going to try and walk you guys through this experience that came, that happened to me this last summer, uh, which was interesting to me. A little bit about me. My name is Josh Dustin. I'm the uh, chief security officer for a company called HireVue. Uh, we do video interviewing. Um, I'm not going to give you a bunch of sales pitch about my company. Uh, if you've ever hired someone and you realize in the first like uh, 15 seconds of an interview that the candidate you're interviewing isn't the right guy, you wish you had like a fast forward for the interview, we provide the fast forward button. So. If you ever wanted that fast forward button, check us out. So, um, quick shameless plug for the password cracking competition for here at SaintCon. Uh, it is hosted at passwordctf.com. There's a few people running it already. Kind of fun. Not a, doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Um, if you don't have a big GPU rig, that's fine. You can crack passwords on your laptop. Use John the Ripper. Use Hashcat. You can do it on your laptop, and you'll you can do okay. So I uh, recommend you get in there and start cracking passwords because it's a lot of fun. So. All right, quick disclaimer. Words and opinions expressed during this talk reflect my own sarcastic opinions and not the sarcastic opinions of my employer or former employers or anyone else. Um, I did work for Adobe, and I'm going to talk about Adobe a little bit. Um, about the Adobe breach they had about three years ago. I did not work there at the time. Uh, I had left. Um, my work at Adobe gave me no inside information about the breach, about the, the data that was breached. I was in a totally different part of the company. Um, I am not revealing anything new. I'm not uh, providing any information that's not freely out there. I'm certainly not going to do anything that I would think would uh, impact Adobe in any way. Um, the guys and gals at Adobe are actually fantastic. Um, in my opinion, they actually did a really great job in responding to the Adobe breach a couple years ago, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so a few things about me. Background, this is me. Uh, I now have a beard, but I don't always intend to shave it off. And just to clarify, uh, in case anybody gets confused, um, this, that's not me. Uh, oh, wow. That was awesome. Um, yeah, that's not me. So I do understand how that can be a little confusing to some people. Um, and I kind of talk like him too. But okay, a couple things to be aware of uh, when listening to me go through this information. Um, I, I think most people are able to concentrate on a topic, uh, think things through, uh, not be distracted. I find as I work with information security people, uh, about 75% of you are ADD. Um, and then <laughs> coming to a, a conference, it's more like 90, 95% uh, percent of, of security conference goers are ADD. And uh, so I just want to say that for you guys, the 95%, you're going to be fine. For that 5% of vanilla people that might be here, um, I want to give you like a perspective that will help you, like a paradigm that you can listen through that may help you understand why I'm talking the way I do. Um, my brain works a little bit differently. If you could imagine living your life constantly distracted, 
by a thousand things all at once, and all those things are pancakes. Okay? That's, that's me. So um, I love pancakes. All right, so what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to talk about the Adobe breach. I'm going to talk about how uh, uh, people are able to get passwords from the Adobe breach, even though the key has not been cracked. Um, how my Amazon account got hacked this summer, which was just awesome. Um, and then more of my summer fun. And then if I have time, I want to talk about securing Python. Do we have Python people in the room? Python people, we have a few. Cool. Um, kind of surprising at a security conference. I apologize. I know that Python is, securing Python is uh, off topic at a security conference. So I hope you forgive me for that. Um, okay. The Adobe breach, 150 million records were leaked. Um, it's kind of a big deal a few years ago. Uh, one of the big issues was that the passwords did not appear to be hashed. They looked like they were encrypted in some way, uh, which isn't industry standard. Usually the industry standard says, various industry standards say to hash your password, salt to hash. And these were all encrypted uh, apparently, and apparently with uh, likely the same key. Um, Funny thing, when we crack passwords, we typically end up getting 80% after some amount of time, 80, 90%. Um, because, uh, well, the method that we're going to talk about, you get it roughly 50% of from the Adobe, um, the Adobe breach. It is kind of interesting to me that they, as far as I know, no one has cracked that key. And so that's limited it to 50%, 50%. So really, Adobe. <laughs> If that was a mistake, it was a good mistake because they're more secure for it, at least three years later. Um, another just side note on Adobe, all companies get breached, not blaming the victim. Those guys are great, like I already said. Um, happened after I left. I was part of a different business unit. Okay. Okay. Back to the ugly stuff. So the the way that this... Uh, data came out was a massive flat text file that had one line for each record is what it appeared to be. Um, this is a screenshot from the from Ars Technica. Uh, that it's actually from this article here on the left. Excuse me. Um, and it you know, shows the format, which I will show here in a second. Um, that's a delicious syrupy stack of pancakes. Okay, so on the um, the first field is some kind of a uh, user ID. I don't really know. It's a uh, it's a number. We don't really know what it's used for, nor do it really matter. But it appears to be unique. Next, you have an email address. Uh, you can see that there's a big black block over these because it's redacted. But that's, that's straight from Ars Technica. They redacted it. Um, on the email address. But as you look down this that column, you see that most of the ones in this screenshot are FBI.gov email accounts. So there was a lot of people that used corporate emails um, from various areas. You have uh, U.S. Senate emails and um, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I don't know that they were verified, so they could have just been anyone using maybe that email account. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's really that person, necessarily. Um, next field is some kind of encrypted value, password, we assume. Um, looks like it's Space64 encoded. I'm not going to talk much about what is known about their encryption type, because it doesn't matter. Um, and next is password hint in clear text. So this guy in particular, whatever his name is at FBI.gov, we have his encrypted password, which we can't crack because we don't know the key. And we, we know it's his anniversary. So we could probably socially engineer him, look him up, find out what his anniversary is, and try different iterations of that till we get it. Um, that might be wrong. He, he might have put in a different hint. That, the hint value could be useful. It could be not. We don't know. You don't know for any individual if that hint is incorrect or useful or, or what. So, so that, that means that none of the, those hints are, are somewhat useful but kind of limited. They don't actually give you any passwords with any, any level of certainty. 
then you start to notice that that encrypted password value shows up repeatedly. Uh, you see the same encrypted value over and over and over throughout the dump. Um, so the most common, if you sort this enormous password dump, it's like 10 gig, you, you sort this enormous dump, sorry, I'm 10 years old, you sort this enormous dump, um, you'll find that the most common password, this one here in the bottom square on the top, there's 1.9 million occurrences of that hash. Um, I'm, I added some asterisks there. I'm not going to be releasing proprietary Adobe information. So. Um, but that's essentially what it looked like. And that same hash is there 1.9 million times. There's 1.9 million of the 130 million that have the exact same password. It's that assumption that we're making there. So whatever that is, it's going to be a common password. It's going to be the word password. It's going to be one, two, three, or something silly like that. But we still don't know what it is. And, but you see the, the password stacking up. Um, you know, these are the, the, what is this, the top seven, eight most common. Just, you, know, you, you can sort them that way um, into just a massive stack. Um, not unlike a massive stack of delicious syrupy pancakes. So if you sort them by the hint, you notice that the hints have collisions as well. For everyone who's using this same password, 1.9 million people, there's a bunch of people who have the same hint, uh, which naturally, if you're using the word password, a lot of people are going to have the same hint, the word is password, or something silly like that. Um, and looking at the most common hints for any given password starts to make it really obvious. So this is that one where we have 1.9 million people using this password. And the top hint with 53,000 people using that hint is 1 to 6. Yeah, <laughs> one, two, three, one dash six, a number. Pretty obvious what this password is, right? So, and this is the case um, if you randomly grab a, a, a line from the Adobe dump. It's a, I found it was about 50% um, of them you could you could divide you could figure out their password with some amount of certainty. This one is obviously very easy because there's so many in the sample. Some of them have 10 or five, and so you only have five hints to go with, and it can be a little bit more tricky, um, and it kind of turns into a fun game. So here's one of the accounts that was in the dump, uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, it was at a, uh, I'll just say it was a, an open free email service. Um, the, the Adobe breach occurred after the Edward Snowden leak. So there's a possibility this could be a different person named Edward Snowden, which that would be really unfortunate. I feel bad for anyone who happened to be named Edward Snowden, um, but uh, besides the Edward Snowden. Anyways, uh, so this was a couple of months after. It could be a different person. Uh, that identifying number at the beginning of each record was low for this account, which if those numbers correspond to when the account was added to the dump, um, then this is likely not someone who made the account after. This is likely actually someone named Edward Snowden or someone who, for whatever reason, before Edward Snowden became famous, used this username. So the, um, the password hints, you have 113 people. The most common password hint is metal, with six people using the word metal. You have two people using palm with a capital, two people using palm with a lowercase, here we have the word element. W on the periodic chart. And kind of close to the bottom, we have W74. So, anybody have any idea what it is? Tungsten. Okay, who just said tungsten? Are you, there. Hold on, I have something for you. Here. Let me hand that to him. All right. That's a uh, pancake mix. Okay, so it was tungsten. <laughs> um, you guys may not be uh, old enough to remember Palm Pilots. They were a thing that we used back in the late 1900s. Uh, it was kind of like a cell phone, but didn't work. Um, 
So Palm had one of their devices was called the tungsten, and it happens to be the W and, and element 74 on the periodic table. Um, I haven't ever had a conversation with Edward Snowden. I'd love to ask him if that was actually his password. But, uh, you know, when this video gets posted on YouTube, can everybody tweet it and include Edward Snowden? We can actually give him a look at it. Because um, <laughs> I'd really love it if he was like, yeah, that's not me. But um, I think he'd probably say that either way. Tell us the truth. Come on, Edward. All right, so fast forward three years. Um, <laughs> this last summer, uh, so I have an Amazon account, as everybody does. I use it a lot. Uh, my wife buys stuff using Amazon pretty much daily. It's my email address, and that way I get the emails whenever she buys stuff. And that works out well, saves our marriage. Um, but she has the password, and actually I don't even know what password she was using. Um, because she, I don't really ever buy stuff. Uh, she buys it, and I get the emails. And so our house is just constantly overrun with packages. And, uh, and I'm constantly getting emails about you know, Blue's Clues and you know, whatever various things. I, I have four children. Um, so I'm constantly getting emails about the random junk that she's buying, and we're constantly getting boxes from Amazon. And um, it's also nice at Christmas time because I get to know what she's buying for me you know, ahead of Christmas morning. Um, so, and then one day this past summer, uh, I think it was June, July, early July, late June, I got an email from Amazon um, with an item that had been purchased. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see the bottom where it says lifelike vein and ring. I'm just not going to read that. So, um, so my first reaction when this happened was a little bit of shock. And I kind of thought maybe this was a phishing attempt, right? Like, uh, <laughs> pretty good one, actually. Uh, if you can determine someone's married and you send that to the email, one, of, one or the other spouse is going to go, uh, what? And click the link. Um, I didn't click the link. But I went to my wife. I asked her uh, if she ordered that. And she said, <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Kind of made me a little uncomfortable. Just, well, go back to that really quick. I don't know if you notice at the top. It actually has the size listed. Um, no, nah, it's just uncomfortable. OK, so uh, when my wife tells me the password, uh, my heart sinks. Because three years have gone by since the Adobe breach. And guess what password she was using for the email account that was in the Adobe breach of mine. She's using the same password I used in Adobe. Awesome. So um, it just kind of hit me that uh, the irony of all of this, um, that this is very likely the way the person got into my account, I'm guessing at this point. Um, so like anyone who, uh, also uh, taking a look at the order, it's being shipped to my house, uh, not, be, not being shipped somewhere else. So I get, it's a gift. Uh, so I called Amazon. Uh, I called Amazon and uh, had a very awkward conversation with Amazon tech support. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there was like three items on the order, right? So I have to like, well, these two items were in our, you know, he, the person got in and they bought the two items that were in our cart and that. So I'm like, well, those were on there. We wanted those, but the other one, my wife said she didn't order it, I promise. And uh, it was just really awkward, right? I mean, just like, you, I'm going to put you on hold for a minute. You can like hear him laughing. Right? <laughs> so, um, and then they, they canceled the order. They, they refund my money. And then he puts me on hold to laugh more. He comes back and he said, it's actually already shipped. So, um, so OK, uh, do I just like not accept it? And it just like set it back. And he goes, no, no. Uh, you just go ahead and keep it. It's a gift from us. I'm like, okay, um, thanks. So, uh, by the way, at the end of the password cracking competition, we're going to be giving out a couple prizes for the winners. <laughs> I just came to mind. I don't know. I, not related. It just. 
Okay, a few weeks after that embarrassing day, I get woken up at 2 a.m. Uh, my wife's phone rang, and uh, she slept through it. Um, it were, we were laying in bed, and uh, I, I have four kids and three Bernese Mountain Dogs. Uh, that's not my dog, actually. But uh, dogs end up in my bed constantly, and my kids end up in my bed constantly. It's usually something like this. Uh, but on this particular night, thankfully, uh, I only had three kids at home. My oldest son, who was 14, was at, and especially for you, uh, thing at a university that was uh, 600 miles away. So um, my younger kids were all at home, and I get this call at 2 a.m. on First on my wife's phone, but then to my phone. My wife slept through it, and then I answer. It says it's a blocked number. And I start talking to him, and at 2 a.m., this guy asks for my son, who's 14, which is kind of a weird thing to happen. So the conversation went something like this. Did you know your son's a computer hacker? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like, a little bit. I mean, I did a little. I, didn't, I don't know why I'd be getting a call at 2 a.m. about it. He said, well, he goes by this, he goes by Doxer. It's actually not what it was, but I don't really feel like dropping this guy's uh, name on in this thing. Um, but we'll just call him Doxer. He goes by Doxer online. He's done some really bad stuff, doxing people. For anybody that doesn't know what doxing, does anybody know what doxing is? They're just collecting a bunch of personal information about somebody, like their social and their address, passwords, junk like that, and just put it on a paste bin. Just dump it on the internet for anyone to see. Right? Um, usually done by... Uh, script kitty level type people. It's not, yeah, it's just kind of the annoying stuff. And like, great. And he's been swatting people. Okay. It's a little bit different. He's been swatting people. He's been, you know, faking a phone call from someone's house to emergency services and getting the SWAT team sent to their house. Really? Um, that's worth a 2 a.m. call, if that's true. Um, my son had been getting into computer security type stuff, and I'd been shepherding him in the right direction, I thought. I'd given him a lot of trust, obviously more than I should have. Um, but at this point, uh, you know, I, hearing that he's swatting people, my first reaction, of course, is dad is, yeah, right, not my kid. So, um, you know, I say, how do you know that this is, that this doctor person that you're talking about is my son? And he said, it's really complicated computer stuff. And so, yeah, just keep talking, I'll try to keep up, right? Um, so, so the first thing he says is, well, uh, go look at his computer. So, yeah, I, I go into his computer, because obviously he's at this EFY thing. He has a phone, but doesn't have a computer with him. I turn it on, um, encrypted bootloader. Love my kid, right? Um, and uh, I'm like, dang, that's not going to work. And uh, encrypted BIOS. So this is, yeah. He's not going to be good. And I know that he uses VMs, and he's probably going to give me a run for my money if I have to try and, and uh, track him that way, but uh, unfortunately. So he gives me an account name to look on his Twitter. He wants me to see Doxer's Twitter. And so I start searching. And I didn't immediately go to Doxer's account on Twitter. I searched for Doxer's name, and I find this. That's my son. And um, that's, I believe that's his profile picture on Facebook. And this person is saying, hey, this is Doxer in real life. He's going to get vanned. So um, now we have people that are threatening my son, who know who he is, um, threatening that they're going to get him thrown in the SWAT van. And you start seeing things like this with his name and his address, which I'm not going to include. And uh, Start getting a little bit nervous. Uh, I still am thinking that this is someone who's angry at me or something. This is not legitimate. He's not. I mean, he's showing me a picture that somebody's saying is him. That doesn't mean anything at all. Um, you know, I trust my son, right? So uh, then I go to the guy's account itself, and he obviously is a uh, a nice kid, I guess. Um, you know, from great. So the first thing I notice here is there's an IP address in the, in, in, there below the name. 
174. And that looks really familiar. Not my IP address, and, but it was my IP address a couple years ago. And that's a little strange. Um, why would this guy be, why, if it was my son, why would he put his IP address on his Twitter anyway? But just kind of weird, but uh, that, that's bizarre. Um, he's bragging about calling the SWAT team on people. Um, he really likes to have Skype open with the person when he does it so that he can see him when the person kicks in the door. This guy's awesome. Real upstanding person. Um, this was a video that he posted um, about somebody getting swatted that he was taking credit for. Uh, I found the news story, and this was a comment on that story uh, from one of the neighbors. She said that the old lady next door ended up going to the hospital with chest pain, kind of a big deal when a bunch of people in SWAT gear with assault rifles come traipsing into your yard. She had a real hard time with it. So, um, yeah, if this is my kid, uh, this is going to be a bad day. Um, yeah. So the caller says, hey, is that your IP address? I said, well, that was an IP address from a couple years ago when I lived in Utah. That's not my IP address. I don't know why you'd have it there. And he said, fine, go to your kid's Facebook. So I go to my own son's Facebook, and I see this. So Backtrack, sure. And I know that he uses Backtrack. Uh, we actually had a conversation about Social Engineering Toolkit a couple weeks before, um, and uh, SMS spoofing specifically. And he took a screenshot and posted it of him sending an SMS spoof to a friend. I thought that was kind of funny, sure, whatever. And the caller says, see, there you go, right there. He's obviously a hacker. That proves it. I'm like, okay. It's because my kid knows what Social Engineering Toolkit is and sent a fake SMS message to a friend does not mean that he's this guy, right? You're going to have to do a lot better than that. So then he says, well, go back to Doxer's Twitter and look at his most recent pictures. Okay. That's not good. So a lot of people use Backtrack and might take a screenshot that looks similar with the same timestamp and the same phone number they're sending it to. So that's bad. Um, and he said, Doxer posted this on Twitter, bragging about sending an SMS text. Um, they did a reverse image search and found my son's Facebook. Oh. OK. Now I'm a little upset, right? Um, now I start scrolling through the rest of the tweets with images. Um, I'm going to edit this part of my talk uh, for language and content. Uh, so I find some tweets that are interesting. A lot of banter, uh, script kitty banter back and forth between young and experienced hackers. Hey, doctor, I'm coming for you. Be ready, some random dude says. And he says, you're harmless. Suck my banana. Um, you don't even have one, your mom doesn't complain, things like that. And then the picture. Now, as a dad, you should never have to see a picture of a banana online. <laughs> never your son's banana, for sure. No dad should ever have to even have, have the thought of a son's banana ever in their mind. That's just not okay. It's just not, that's like the, there is nothing, I mean, there's, Okay, everyone in here, you're all hackers, you're all computer security people, you've all seen some terrible pictures. We all know the pictures. Your son's banana is worse, I promise. Okay, it is the worst thing you could possibly imagine. Um, so then it goes on, and I'm like about to barf. Um, that looks pretty small. Oh yeah, um, seven inches. There's the banana with his ruler, okay. Um, and at that point, I'm going, okay, wait a minute, I know my genetics. So, <laughs> eh, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, the evidence was kind of convincing, but not, I don't know. Um, honestly, this was terrible. Like, all joking aside, this was a terrible, terrible moment. At this very second, it's 2.30 in the morning. I'm sitting in a chair in my bedroom with my laptop, with my wife 
going, what is going on? Leaning over to see my screen. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and she's like, now my imagination is going to go crazy. And I'm like, let it go crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, So uh, time for a calm talk with my son. Uh, divine intervention <laughs> that my son was 600 miles away, really. If he had been in the next room over, we would have had a conversation at 2 a.m. that would have damaged our relationship. <laughs> so I'm glad because this, I texted him immediately. I called him immediately. He didn't answer. It's 2 a.m. Um, and then I thought, this is good. I can do a little more research, um, which I don't want to do. And... <laughs> And I can calm down. And I did. Got a, got a hold of him the next morning. And uh, had a little bit of a heart-to-heart. -heart. And I said, I know you've been doing stuff online that you shouldn't. And he immediately did a, yeah. Um, and uh, I didn't want to go into details with him because uh, you confront your son about his hacking activity and he knows there's pictures of his banana. He, that's going to just like, a 14 year old kid can't deal with that. So I just kind of left the details. I, I wanted to make him think that I didn't necessarily feel everything. Um, I told him, I'm going to help you and point you in the right direction with security. You can be a contributor and not someone who tears things down. Someone did that for me a long time ago, um, Miles Johnson. Uh, well, you guys probably know him. Um, and it, it, it made a huge difference uh, in my life. And you know, obviously, I want to. What matters is more than anything is that he makes uh, recompense for what he's done and that we, I get him pointed in the right direction and that he makes good choices going forward. So I told him, you know, I will help you going forward, um, you know, but there's going to be some changes. You will not have a single password in your life that I won't have. Um, I want you to tell me every alias you've ever used on every system, every, everywhere. And right now, anything you've ever used uh, where you haven't used your real name, I want you to go and delete it right now. And that's the price of admission. Otherwise, this is going to be a bad day. Um, he was okay with that. He was very apologetic, and he hung up. And then I watched as Doctor continued to post and said things like, I know you guys are trying to get me, but you're harmless, and nobody can, nobody can get me. Like, okay. So I send my son a message saying, just so you know, this is how you uh, delete a Twitter account, in case you were wondering. And he said, I've already deleted the only Twitter account I've ever used. So I call him back. Um, when he gets the details, he says he's innocent. He says this isn't him. Um, every dad wants to trust their kid. and. Uh, we all know that dad that trusts their, like, druggy kid that's doing all kinds of bad stuff. It wasn't me. Um, and I'm not going to be that guy. But, and there's just enough evidence. As I'm going through these tweets, there's things that are similar to things that my son has said. And it's just, um, there's a lot of things that were surprising that wouldn't make sense. But there was enough evidence that, or not evidence, but uh, there's, there's enough facts that lined up and seemed to, in, to that, corroborated the story that this was my son, uh, that I was convinced. But when he told me, sincerely, this isn't me, and I can hear in his voice as he's looking at the pictures of himself that he's scared. He's scared that these guys are, are going to send a SWAT team for him. And that, I mean, there's all these guys that are pictures of him online. He was terrified. Um, so I, I said, I believe you. Do nothing. You know, don't start posting about it. Don't talk about it. Just do nothing. Let me do my thing. And it's okay. Hung up. Doxer continues to post. So now I need to prove it's not my kid. Because um, I believe him. I really do. But I'm going to verify it. So I start coming up with ideas on how I can do that. Go to the, where he's at EFY, strap him in a polygraph, and uh, you know, put the bright lights on him. Um, that's going to damage our relationship, so that's not a great one. So I threw that out. Uh, next idea is tell him, call him, say, turn off your phone. He's not, he doesn't have a computer. At EFY, they don't have access to a computer. Um, but he has his phone. And uh, you know, just call him, tell him to turn it off. 
watch and verify that he turns it off. I can watch on like by my iPhone, see that it stops pinging. And then get Doxer to keep talking, you know, badger him online until he says something. I know it's not my kid. Um, if I tell him I'm doing something, if I go on and say turn off your phone, he's going to know I'm doing something. I'm not going to feel totally comfortable that he actually didn't just call a friend and say, hey, post for me if he knows I'm doing stuff. So I don't, I, I don't want him to know. I, to really be a test where I'm going to be comfortable at the end of this feeling like I am sure he can't know I'm doing it. So I decide that criteria for myself. So next idea, I'll disable his phone using at and I'll just call at and or get on the website and I'll disable his phone. Um, that way his phone's dead, he won't know why. You know, done deal. Um, and I'll get Doxer to keep posting. Um, Wi-Fi. Even a, a phone without, you know, without an account with a carrier, you get on the local Wi-Fi at McDonald's and post. So that kind of stinks. Um, so that's not going to do anything for me. So then I think, okay, you can go into my, find my iPhone, put it in lost mode, and you can put in a new code. You have to put in that code, you know, when the, the phone will say it's locked and they can't, uh, you know, they can't get into it unless they put the code in. So, um, I looked at that a little bit, and I, I come to find out, y if you have a code on the phone already, uh, you can put in that code, and it works. You don't have to put in the code that you set when you do the Find My iPhone, unfortunately. So that doesn't do any good either. That'll just tell them that I'm doing something. Um, you know, and then, of course, the next idea is to just give up and eat pancakes. So then we come up with idea six, Operation Kill Sam's Phone. So I get on Find My iPhone to get his current location in Virginia. And have you guys ever tracked somebody using Find My iPhone? I happened to notice while I was tracking someone with Find My iPhone, that if you refresh their, you refresh the location a lot, it hits the phone every time, and it drains their battery like crazy. Like, um, my wife was driving back from Florida, and I kept checking to see where she was. And I killed her phone in like an hour and a half, just checking to see where she was, because I like, well, I obsess. Where is she? Um, so I did this on purpose. I just found where my son was. I knew he was at some dance they had, so I could see he was in the middle of a field. And uh, I just started refreshing it. And it took me about an hour to get, hour and a little bit to get his phone almost dead. It was at 1%, and I saw him go back to the dorm with the other kids. And he plugged it in at 1%. <laughs> Dang. It was close. Um, I mean, I can wait till he gets home. I can take his phone away. I don't want to wait till he gets home. I want to know that's not my kid's banana. So, um, yeah. So that, that plan didn't work. Um, you know, it spent an hour, noticed it was plugged in. So I'm discouraged, and I realized that all these plans, besides polygraph, they all center around getting a teenage kid to put down his technology. It's not gonna happen. Right. Um, do any of you guys have teenagers? They don't put down their phone, right? At least mine doesn't. Um, so that's really frustrating. So then I'm switch gears and I start thinking about how well how can I get a how can you get a 14 year old 600 miles away to put down their phone without them knowing you're trying to do it? Uh, you know what other times have I gotten my kid to put his phone down of his own free will? Uh, never. Um, ever. Uh, and then as I'm thinking about it, no, there is actually. Uh, water sports, <laughs> they'll put down their phone. And uh, I was like, okay, now I just need to get someone to take my son to the lake in Virginia, right? So that is not going to happen. Um, and I remember, I took him to Lake Lanier, it's, by, it's in Georgia, um, for like a full day, a few weeks before, um, it was before this whole thing started, of course, but uh, we were on the lake all day. Uh, and he was with me the whole time, on a boat. And I put his phone, because we were going to put his Ziploc bag, we didn't have one, so I put his phone in the car, in the glove compartment, and I locked the car. I know he didn't have it. He didn't have any technology. I texted my wife saying, hey, we're going out on the water now, and I left my phone in the car. And I texted her when I got out of, out of the um, lake got back in the car. So I went back and looked at those timestamps. So I have the time frame, exact time frame for that Saturday that, that he had no phone, no connection at all. We were in the middle of a huge lake. 
So I went back and looked at Doxer's account, and um, first thing I noticed is that he had a couple of tweets during that time. I'm like, okay, that's good. Um, and then I think time zones. I don't know what time zone he's in. I don't know, I don't know what time zone Twitter posts in. Does it show you the time that they posted you know, for something that's weeks ago? Is it going to show you the time stamp of your local time? Or is it going to show that of the poster's local time? So I, I went back and looked, uh, did a little investigating. It appeared that it was, because if it was my time, I had tweets right in the middle of it. Um, but I'm not sure. And I, I certainly don't know this guy's time zone. Um, so I went back and found that uh, the badgering, uh, I, I had gotten him talking because I wanted to keep him talking so that if I could kill my son's phone, uh, he, I would know. So I created an alias on Twitter and I started badgering him <laughs> to, get him to <laughs> get him to keep tweeting. And I noticed the timestamps on his tweets were Pacific. This is probably the default, doesn't mean anything. Um, his account says he lives in Russia. Um, so they're, they're Pacific, which means it shows in the poster's time. So then I have to convert the time zone of his posts on that day to my timestamps so I, so I know that it's, and it wasn't. So uh, when I went back and looked at that time frame, Eastern, um, there were a bunch of posts during the time we were in the lake. So I had the most enormous sigh of relief I've ever had in my life. Um, and that's all I could think was, not my banana. Not my son's banana. Um, like, I've never been so thankful to know that it wasn't my son's banana. Um, and so at that point, I actually was able to look to my wife and be like, you have no idea what I have saved you from the last few days. So, um, and I was then able to sleep the sweet slumber, uh, free of uh, uh, the nightmares of a man who's seen his son's banana. I then regain contact with the original hacker that calls me, that called me that night. Um, I, uh, I got on Twitter. I didn't know his Twitter handle. And so I contacted him. Uh, I created a, an account and posted and said, hey, it was like InfoSec dad guy or something. Um, and I said, hey, you called me, call me back. And the guy called me, I missed the number, and then he messaged me. Um, so we talked. And he apologized for, <laughs> for, for the calls and for the uh, unsavory item he had sent me, which was kind of awesome. Um, and he uh, told me that it wasn't my son, that, that he would verified that it wasn't my son. Now, as soon as I had realized that it wasn't him, I sent out this, this tweet saying, hey, call me. It's not my kid, and I can prove it. Um, Okay, it's my word, but I can still tell him, I can give him my word, I know it's not him. So they ended up finding him. Um, this Twitter conversation happened uh, several days later. Uh, and what they did was they, uh, um, they exploited Firefox WebRTC uh, vulnerability and were able to get his IP that way. As soon as they confronted him with that name online, uh, he went dark. So um, he's a guy in his 20s. Is in the National Guard, and uh, all that information is now with law enforcement. And, and then this kind of sad um, comment. I said, you know, I have no idea how happy I am seeing a dude's banana and being like, that had better not be my kid. And he said, yeah, actually his parents have seen it now too. So somewhere, someone is living that terrifying Thing that I had to go through, and I feel for them because that was—it was really terrible. Um, anyways, okay. Um, so lessons learned: number one, not my kid's banana. Uh, <laughs> number two, don't reuse passwords. Right. Uh, number three, be aware that false evidence can be placed. Uh, my son on Twitter or on Facebook had said, "There's no place like 127.0.0.1." like the dumbest joke ever, sorry. Um, if you have that shirt on right now, I'm sorry. But it's dumb, okay? Um, <laughs> it was funny like in 1999. So my son said that and uh, uh, Doxer had posted that same thing. It was actually where, his, where my IP address was in his title. He wrote that. 
thought it was really funny. Um, so somebody, one of the guys trying to figure out who he was, searched for that and found my son's Facebook. Um, he posted on Doxer's Twitter and said, you're Sam Dustman, aren't you? And uh, Doxer said, oh, you figured me out. And, and they went on to the next thing. And he didn't think twice about it. Doxer then went to Sam's Facebook and watched it and waited. And he, he researched my son. He, he came up with, you know, he, he found the IP address my son was using when he played Minecraft a couple years ago in Utah because um, it was the same email address that he had on Facebook. Um, there was a server that posted some logs and it had the IP address. So he took that IP address and he put it in his Twitter knowing that people would end up connecting the dots. And then he continued to watch my son and when my son posted something, happened to post a, uh, uh, you know, that Metasploit, uh, the, the social engineering toolkit screenshot, he took the opportunity knowing that they would do a reverse image search and it would lead back to my kid. He actually put in that false evidence on purpose. So, and it ended up being pretty convincing. So, you know, just be aware false evidence can be put out maliciously. Um, you know, and that uh, having, having social media photos available, having social media open in general, uh, even if you're just posting things that you think are benign, can be used in ways that you wouldn't expect. Um, at DerbyCon, uh, I went to a social engineering training and we were doing some recon on someone and found that they were a scout leader. And uh, the person doing the training said, so now I would probably just generate an email and send them a payload and say, hey, I was at this scout event because they had posted pictures from it. Um, some of my scouts had some pictures that have pictures of your kids in it, uh, your kids from your troop. Let me know if you want any of these. I have a bunch more. They're attached. Um, s just letting someone know something that's not what you wouldn't think would be a vulnerability. You're not posting pictures of your kids in a bathing suit. You're just posting you know, pictures from something. Just giving information about your life can be useful to bad guys. So, all right, we have just a couple minutes left, which is good, because as I said, the Python problem thing, I kind of don't think this is really applicable, but I've been reading that Python is like a big thing in security. It doesn't seem applicable to me when I looked into it, but okay, whatever. Um, I mean, so we have Python problems like soups, like, like realsies. We have Python problems because they get really big, right? Like, like they get really, really big and they eat like a ton of stuff. Because I hear Python's a big thing in security, so I Googled it, I learned all about it. So um, apparently they're in Florida and there's like a bunch of them. And, uh, and as their numbers are going up, the numbers of like small free animals are going down. Um, like this rabbit right here, they had a little transmitter on it and then they followed the transmitter after a while and they found a snake. Um, so, and they, they have like big stuff in them. I was gonna give you guys like, uh, I know, I know everybody wants to kind of see the internals of Python and uh, I, wanted, I wanted to deliver on that, right? And then uh, I also kind of wanted to keep this G-rated. So I removed the next slide. If you wanna see what was inside this Python, you know, you can uh, ask me after, I'll show you. This is kind of gory, gotta keep it PG. Um, okay, so security conference, keep it in security. How do we secure the Python? Uh, first, you gotta get permits. Uh, so, <laughs> so I got a couple permits for capturing pythons. Um, I got one from the uh, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. It allows you to actually have the python alive, otherwise they have to be dead in Florida. The heck? Um, and also, uh, in the national park, they're actually protected. They protect all wildlife, even the stuff that's there eating the other wildlife that's not supposed to be there. Um, so you actually can't catch pythons in the Everglades National Park unless you have, a, they have a whole, a special, it's not a permit, it's actually a, uh, you need to become a volunteer and you're an authorized agent for capturing pythons. So since the National Park Service is a federal agency, I'm a federal agent. I'm gonna get my badge soon, I think. Um, so, okay, gotta give you some tips on how to secure the pythons. Number one thing to know, they have a bunch of teeth. Um, those teeth are really sharp and you don't wanna mess with them. So we recommend that you not touch that end that has all the teeth. Um, you just stay away from the teeth end because um, bad things happen if you do uh, mess with that end. Uh, okay, I have like one minute left. Um, yeah, just stay away from that end. You can deal with the other end. That end actually has some bad stuff too. Uh, I come to find out, um, and, and, and that and the end with the biting can. Why is my thing like self-advancing? I thought I had that turned off. 
Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the end with the teeth can come back, even when you're holding the end that doesn't have the teeth, which also is unpleasant, apparently. Um, so other, other things to know, um, don't be a tool. If you're going to actually try and catch a big snake, you should use a tool, because they don't, they're lacerations and stuff, they don't have to go to the hospital. And, um, they're great. Uh, and when you've got to commit, like, it's time to commit. My wife used to tell me that all the time. She doesn't really do it anymore. But when it's time to commit, you've got to, like, you got to do it. You can't just, you can't be, like, you know, half into it. And uh, uh, don't forget about the end with the teeth. Uh, it's still a problem even once you grab it. Um, so that's important. And uh, uh, don't ever hold a venomous snake, by the way. Just kind of a side note. Uh, that guy's an emerald. So uh, anyways, yeah. Python security. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Anybody have any questions about bananas or pancakes? Amazon? Free shipping?